An Atlantic rematch. An American reshuffle. Shouting. Getting round. Plus, plenty in Doc Talk. We've crossed the pond and we're in the Big Apple, New York, and there's plenty going on. The return transatlantic trip for the Amoka fleet starts from here, and for many it's the big one. Not only is it the last major offshore race before the Vendée Globe, but for some it's the last chance to qualify. Plus, SailGP is here. And while this event and the America's Cup are quite separate, there's no getting away from the fact that for many of the crews, this is another valuable opportunity to get match fit at high speed on foils. But first, the New York Vendée, the return trip from New York back to Les Sables d'Olonne. The trip out to the States had proved very revealing. It wasn't what most of the crews had expected. And on the way home, there was more drama to come. New York, dazzling and vertiginous. City of extremes, cradle of the American dream. In the city that never sleeps. In the shadow of Manhattan's skyscrapers. This is where the final qualifying race for the Vendée Globe will start. The punchy conditions in the race from Lorient in France to New York had seen the Amoka leaderboard rearranged. Several of the big guns were either absent or had suffered gear problems along the way. Some were now starting to feel the pressure especially those that still needed to qualify for this year's non-stop single-handed race around the world, the Vendée Globe. But for all, the race back from New York to Les Sables d'Olonne was also a chance to test their boats and equipment while lining up against their competitors. Based on experience and previous form, four top dogs stood out. Thomas Royon on Vulnerable. Jorn Richom on Paprec Arkea, who'd won the leg to New York, Charlie Dallan on Massif Santé Prévoyance, and Jeremy Bayou aboard Chiral. Their comments before the start of the race, alongside those who'd been able to push hard on the way out, said much about the state of their campaigns and where their focus lay as the clock counted down. Le niveau de préparation de l'ensemble de la flotte, ça va être, ça va être intéressant. Bah, une cadence sans casser, donc c'est aussi un bon test pour les équipes techniques, euh, pour éprouver les bateaux, et puis pour les marins, tenir dans la durée. Après, ça reste des, des courses. Maintenant, les transats assez courtes, on va mettre entre 9 et, et 11 jours, donc euh, finalement, c'est assez rapide. Ça va nous permettre de, bah, de se confronter avec des bateaux qui sont en config dans des globes, comme nous, euh, de voir un petit peu les forces en présence, euh, la façon dont, dont les équipes sont, sont prêtes pour l'échéance Vendée Globe. Oui, yeah, this is going to be the last race uh, before the Vendée Globe. Uh, we'll have uh, one trans transatlantic to test ourselves against the others. So we'll be looking out for their, their speed, their choices, their uh, sail choices, their routes. And uh, we'll uh, analyze all this on the way and then after the race. So it's uh, quite important for us because we have a uh, last few decisions to make uh, for our, uh, the choice of our kit for the, for the Vendée. On avait eu trois semaines bien occupées ici à essayer de réparer le foil et la préparation était vraiment pas, pas géniale. Euh, et malgré ça, derrière, bah, tout l'équipe avait bien bossé et, et j'avais sorti une, une belle course. Mais la préparation ici, le bateau, l'état dans lequel le bateau est arrivé ici est, est bien meilleur qu'il y, qu y a 8 ans. Et, et, euh, et du coup, aujourd'hui, euh, je retiens que je suis capable de faire ça et que et que si j'ai gagné il y a quelques années, je suis toujours capable de gagner, de gagner cette fois-ci. C'est la dernière opportunité d'identifier de, les éventuelles faiblesses du bateau, d'identifier les points de, les derniers points de développement possibles avant le chantier d'été. On va continuer à naviguer après l'arrivée de la course, un petit mois. On va tester, on va commencer à, on va commencer à recevoir nos voiles pour le vent des globes. Ça va être l'occasion de les essayer, d'éventuellement les envoyer en, 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 en voilerie pour des petits ajustements pendant, pendant l'été. Cette course est importante pour nous pour, pour aller chercher ces dernières réponses. 
Et parce que voilà, on n'a plus qu'une dernière, une seule opportunité avant le vent des globes de remodifier un peu le bateau. C'est euh, cet été, sur les chantiers d'été. Quand on va remettre les bateaux à l'eau après, bah, ça sera la configuration euh, définitive pour le, pour le vent des globes. Donc voilà, c'est une course euh, qui, est, qui est importante pour l'équipe à, à plusieurs niveaux. J'ai un bon bateau. The fleet is really, really hard to beat. For me, it's going to be hard to be in front of. And yeah, I want to push as hard as I can and I'm lucky because Initiative Care is in great shape. Um, we had a few issues that the team have done a really good job and managed to fix. Um, so we are at 100% and I can push as hard as, as I can um, and that's what I'm planning to do on the way back. So uh, sending it. I don't have a particular opinion about the weather. I take it whatever, whatever they give me I take. So I'm happy with, with anything and uh, I would be happy with a massive storm to test the boat. But I wouldn't really say that because then we don't want a massive storm. <laughs> the only thing I really don't want is, is a big uh, pitol, a big light wind zone where we drift around for days. <laughs> But everything else, we, we are fine. The boats are fast in any direction. They are almost as fast upwind as downwind. So <laughs> it's quite hard about what my objectives are for this race because this is my final piece of Vendée qualification. And so that's what I'm thinking about. Um, but we have worked so hard on developing our boat and the boat performance and I've been training hard so I want to take this opportunity to to solidify the the improvements that we've made. The 3,200 mile race back across the Atlantic would last around a week and for the first time the fleet was set off from a virtual start line. We just started the New York Monday on our own in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Quite close to Boris, he's just behind me. Um, and then we've got most of the fleet to leeward. Um, so here, yeah, so I'm pretty happy with my start. Um, uh, to windward, which is where I wanted to be, with the most of the fleet to leeward. So we got PMB and Toto up front. Um, and yes, I'm pretty happy with this. What a picture, look at that. My main worry is now to hit some fishing gear. Yeah, well, I uh, with ropes attached and fishing equipment. After a stormy first night, the two Sams, Davis and Goodchild, have broken free from the fleet. What a wild night. We're now flapping around um, with no wind and waves. Very exciting. Uh, last night we had 35 knots. Um, with too much sail up. So a little bit of everything, uh, not very stable, um, but it's going all right, I guess. As teams headed east, the fleet was stretching out north and south, making it hard to predict who'd made the right choice. Boris Herman, the most northerly of the competitors, was among those who hoped they'd made the right call. Uh, that we get out of this. Um, such a fascinating phenomena, the Gulf Stream must be one of the strongest uh, transportation routes of energy on this planet. It's good for beautiful sunset, but not good for the wind. It's not a very easy transat. The, uh, the forecast change every 12 hours, a new forecast comes out and it's nothing like the last one. And then uh, you look at a forecast and it's not exactly what you've got outside. So uh, uh, trying to choose what to do, which sails to make and how to go is, uh, is a bit of witchcraft. <laughs> Boris Herman and Charlie Dallin were the furthest to the north and leading as the boats to the south were closing in. But Herman was now moving and feeling relaxed. We are now full main and J2 and it's quite nice. I should go to sleep though. Good night. On the tracker, it was clear how much faith Boris Herman had put in an extreme northerly route paying off. Day six, New York Vendée race. We are now five days, 22 hours at sea. And I'm quite far north. Over here is Greenland. And uh, the Labrador current with cold water. We are in the middle of a high pressure. The sea and the sky look silver, but we are moving despite the light wind. 
Meanwhile, Charlie Dallan had split from Herman and was now leading the race by a substantial margin. Like everyone else, Pip Hare on Medallia was feeling the pressure. It's tough going, really shifty winds, freezes up and down. Um, so need constant attention. And I've been really zoomed in, like so tightly zoomed in. All I've been looking at is screens and the cockpit. Those to the south were enjoying fast reaching conditions below the Azores, before then facing heavy seas and a strong headwind of 35 knots. More than 2,000 kilometres to the north, Boris Herman jibed on Thursday morning to finally make his way towards the French coast. His plan was to take advantage of a building breeze from behind, from where he could start his assault for second place behind Charlie Dallin. After 10 days and three hours of racing, Charlie Dallin crossed the finishing line in Les Sables de Lon in first place, covering 3,700 miles at an average speed of 15 knots. J'ai retrouvé mon niveau, <laughs> et ça, ça fait du bien. Ce bateau est génial. Uh, ce bateau massif, il est uh, à vide dans toutes les conditions, au près, au portant, au travers. Uh, il est vraiment uh, génial. C'était uh, vraiment une super course. J'ai pris énormément de plaisir du début à la fin. 17 hours later, Boris Herman's big gamble to the north had paid off as he crossed the line in second place, just as he had in the leg to New York. This was clearly a big boost for Herman and his team. It's been no secret that his boat, Militia Sea Explorer, is one of the heaviest in the fleet, leaving some to question whether it can deliver against lighter, potentially faster machines. Two second places in two ocean races that both included a wide variety of conditions appears to have answered the critics. It's spectacular the number of people who come here. It's a Sunday afternoon, but it's quite super. The enthusiasm for the voile. Thank you to the people here to come here to celebrate this score. It only exists in the Sable de Lorraine. Next across the line was Jeremy Bayou who'd held on to third place in a tight battle with Sebastian Simon and Thomas Royal. Meanwhile, back out on the race course, others were celebrating too. Happy Monday! I found some wind! Yes! Yes, this is like breathing out. This is what we're supposed to be doing. But disaster had struck for Sam Goodchild. I imagine you have seen that we were battled, madam. C'est pas trop pour quoi encore, on fait chaque, chaque chose en son temps et là l'équipe technique travaille sur des solutions à terre pour, pour les, les, les options logistiques et moi je travaille sur quand même de fortune pour avancer un peu plus que, que de nœuds. The other Sam, Sam Davies, had finished sixth and while she was pleased with this result, the race had also been a success in other ways. I'm really happy with the result as well because I managed to kind of uh, overtake a few boats in the last over the last week and uh, sail with some really good, um, really good skippers like Johan and Justine um, for days on end. So, in having them in visual sight the whole time, and um, it's really good to to learn how to trim the boat and to push the boat when there's other people right next to you. So. Uh, yeah, it was a great race, and uh, um, and I was happy as well to be able to hang on to Johan uh, right up to the finish. And uh, I'm not sure. I think he, I guess he probably had a little problem, and so I was close enough to take the opportunity when it arrived and and sneak past him before the finish. So uh, really happy to get six. As each skipper crossed the line, it became clear that this had been an unusual and extremely tactical race. This was a, a longer race than we expected. Uh, we, were go, we, we thought we were going for nine days and it took us 12. So um, we had a big uh, weather change in the middle of the course where we thought we were going to get ahead of a front and we didn't. And so we ended up in a very uh, different uh, scenario. And uh, that was tough on the, on the mind to uh, get ourselves back into a, a new race, a different race. and. Um, Although, you know, that was very interesting, it's very unusual for us and uh, it's all, you know, very good preparation for the Vendée Globe in six months. The New York Vendée had been a challenge, but it had also provided the final list of 40 skippers for the Vendée Globe. 
starting from Les Sables d'Olonne on the 10th of November, in France there is no bigger race. When GP rocked up in New York, it was for the penultimate event in season four. The Kiwis were getting quite close to the top, but there'd also been a bit of a reshuffle over the previous events. New York was to shuffle it even further. Before the fleet arrived for the Mabdala New York Sail Grand Prix, the leaderboard was already in a state of flux. The usually dominant Australians had seen the Kiwis pass them in the overall standings, after a difficult run of events for Slingsby and his crew. The Kiwis had notched up four wins this season and were on a roll. But conditions in the Big Apple were to prove challenging as the breeze danced around the foiling threshold, making life hard for anyone who splashed down during racing. Well, and it was just then punished for mistakes. We see here the United States, they fall off the foils, error in that manoeuvre and one mistake can turn a good performance into a bad performance. The opening race saw the British, led by Giles Scott, build on an impressive performance in Halifax by taking the first win in New York. The Swiss, led by Nathan Outridge, won the second race and the Canadians, with Phil Robertson at the helm, took third. Evidence, if any was needed, that it was difficult to stay at the top. The fourth and final fleet race was won by Tom Slingsby's Australian team, but it wasn't enough to get the Sail GP rock stars into the final. Instead, the top three that made it through were New Zealand, Canada and Emirates GBR. And even though the previously dominant Australians hadn't made it through to the final, Slingsby knew that things could have been worse. Oh, I mean, somehow the points worked out pretty well for us, considering everything was, that was happening, like we heading into that final fleet race, I think we were almost going to get knocked out of the, the top three even. It was, we were probably back in eighth place or something, and to win that last race, jump four places, and then a couple of our close rivals didn't have a good race. It, it all worked out well for us. We got a bit lucky out of this event. I kind of feel like we're sort of getting out of here with a, a good result when we might not have deserved it. And yeah, we just got to move on. And yeah, San Francisco will be interesting. An okay result. So um, yeah, pretty frustrating day, but um, plenty of potential being unlocked at the moment. So looking forward to the next one. We were we were so close to being the final and. Uh, we are in a different position, different point, uh, but I think everything can happen in San Francisco. It's a really tricky racing area, especially for the teams that never done it. But in the meantime, the New York final was the focus. Here, the conditions continued to put stress on the teams, but the Kiwis managed to extract a small advantage off the start line and turn it into an impressive win. To be honest, we're, we're not just going to the final to, to be there, we, we want to go there to win it. So, you know, this weekend was our, our last chance to compete in the final before San Fran and to, to put on a performance like we did. And it's something that you know, we're really proud of as a team and to you know, carry that momentum into San Fran now is something we're really excited about. Obviously a bit too far, sorry mate. Yeah, the final's a tricky one. There's three boats, it's slightly different and that race you had to win the pin and I was in a position to attack the Kiwis and I actually decided not to, which is probably slightly out of character and thought we could have a crack at pushing over them and probably made a slight error just off the line but look it's um yeah there's, there's not much in it and the start was very important in that final. So we're super pleased at the whole whole squad um, but yeah would have been would have been nice to have done a few things differently in that final in a nice position and didn't quite get the start we needed and there just wasn't many passing lanes out there so um, yeah third place here in New York but I think another, another solid result that, that, that we can be proud of, but would have been nice for to get a little bit more. Yeah, we're really happy. I mean, these conditions were quite different to Halifax, so it was cool to come off the back of a win there and, and you know, for the team to perform in, in different conditions here in New York. And yeah, it's just also, always awesome to make a final, you know, the, the format with the three-way shootout for the win is just so, so cool to be involved with. Next stop is the grand final in San Francisco, where the top three teams in the season's leaderboard will get to the $2 million final. Success in New York had secured the place for New Zealand, but behind them there was a tightly packed queue. 
So with the grand finale yet to go, there was plenty worth talking about. The Kiwis were now on the top of the pile. The Brits had found new form with Giles at the helm. The French had proved just how handy they are on foils. Meanwhile, the Australians were down the pan. San Francisco was going to be a very interesting finale indeed. At the beginning of the year, X Yachts announced a new project that would take them back into the territory that made their name 40 years ago, racing. And they haven't held back their ambition either. Their goal? To create the most competitive 40-foot handicap racer on the market, the XR41. Aimed at ORC racing, X Yachts had pulled together a team of outside experts who specialise in computational fluid dynamics, ratings analysis and the ORC rules to work alongside its own designers. They've also drawn on the experience of professional sailors like Bauer Becking and Jesper Radic, as well as working with surge projects on the deck layout and interior. From specific design studies such as the effect of fore and aft overhangs, the position of maximum draft and the fullness of the hull, using advanced design techniques, the team has studied the performance and rating implications in minute detail. Due for launch next year, the main focus for the XR41 will be the ORC World Championships in August. 2024 has been a full-on season already for Henry Lloyd. As well as investing heavily in new products and a raft of new initiatives, the company has been developing internally too. The most recent appointment is two-time international moth world champion Simon Payne, who joins the company in a new role as chief commercial officer. Working closely with executive chairman Knut Frostad, the appointment underlines the company's clear ambition to remain close to the heart of the sport to create the best kit possible. And when you see some of their latest products, it's easy to see how they're achieving this. From their highly breathable and waterproof dry pro fabric to slide guide treatments on the inside faces, along with some impressive detailing throughout, the new ranges have represented one of the biggest step changes for the company in its long history. And on top of this, they've been busy supplying Ineos Britannia with their kit, as well as launching a new flagship store in the centre of Oslo as well. It may be a tiny island 35 miles off Germany's northwest coast, but Heligoland drew in a big crowd for this year's North Sea Week. The 89th edition of the event drew in 130 boats and 1,000 sailors arriving on the island for 15 races, including one of the toughest offshore races in Europe, the 510-mile Pantaneous Round Skagen race. First held in 1932, North Sea Week attracts a wide variety of experience and abilities among the competing crews. The range of conditions is equally varied, making the lure of setting a new record for the biennial round Skagen race as enticing as it is challenging. Despite having all the right credentials, the Elliott 52 Raphael took line honours but missed setting a record by just under four hours. So while this year's benign conditions will no doubt convince many more to return, the weather didn't provide the record-breaking headlines. But that's not something that will worry most of the thousand sailors that took part this year. Most of us take wetsuits for granted, but Zyke have made an interesting new step forward in the development of a new generation of technical clothing. Their new X range of wetsuits are made from natural Ulex rubber instead of neoprene which is toxic to produce and hard to recycle. Zyke are particularly excited about the new products as they say that there's no compromise to the performance of their wetsuits which are available for a much wider range of body types and sizes. In particular, for the first time, there are more female sizing options than there are for men. On the technical front, Zyke say that the integration of graphene-infused fabrics can return up to 20% more body heat as well as drying more quickly. Climbing into a cold, soggy wetsuit on the second day could be a thing of the past. I'm sold already. With all the noise and excitement that's been surrounding the build-up to the America's Cup, it's easy to forget that this is a match racing event. Some of you have been quite vocal on this, and for good reason. Until boats started going three times faster, 
boat on boat close quarters tactics was what it was all about. And one of the videos that slipped into the Planet Sail email box recently was a highlight of the Congressional Cup in Long Beach, California. This is a great reminder as to why the World Match Racing Tour that this event is part of is still such a busy and hard fought circuit. Here's a snippet of the final day at Long Beach. For 59 years, the Congressional Cup has defined modern match racing, and after four days racing, only four teams remain. I think today we're, we're going to go out and just keep doing what we've been doing all week. We're 2-0 behind against uh, Chris Poole, who is uh, the defender here, but I think a Crimson Blazer would fit me well, so... <laughs> we just need to sail the boat the way we know how and everything else will come together. So yeah, just going to go out there, give it our best shot and yeah, have a great time doing it because we're asked where you'd rather be, Matt Tracing in the world right now. Keep it up! Drop your kite! Drop it! Oh. Oh. Avoiding, avoiding. Is Monin keeping clear? There's contact for sure. There's the penalty flag in the One air. Time. Hey, Monin is just having his way with Chris Poole. Going to see another penalty likely here. Two oh. blue flag penalties. Oh. Your first finalist in the 59th Congressional Cup is Chris Poole. In an aggressive group. Now, oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Here we go. It's all on. Oh. 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 Whoa, oh my goodness, Ian Williams gets the penalty for that. I had spinnaker in my face, so I didn't really know about the second penalty. You know, I think we're sailing well, we're sailing fast. I think we've got a good chance to win the next race. The race is going to go to Ian Williams, which means, ladies and gentlemen, your second finalist for the Congressional Cup is now Ian Williams. And so in this year's final, the seven-time world champion takes on the reigning Congressional Cup winner with two of the world's best match racing skippers competing against each other. The stage is set for an epic final. Come on, he says he's got room. How's that, Scotty, how's that possible? There's not room in there. Oh. Oh, oh, no room in there. There's room in there. They're locked in there. They are stuck. Oh my goodness. And it's a blue flag penalty. That's Chris Poole. Poole could be in trouble. Oh, no, I think Williams is, is he losing it. Mikey Poole's penalty, if there is one. Oh, very close indeed. Look at how close that is. Don't chive. Attack set for both teams. Heading for the line, just a few boat lengths left. As Chris Poole and crew head for the line, Riptide Racing. They won last year, they came back. And now, ladies and gentlemen, they've done it again. Chris Poole is your Congressional Cup champion. Uh, it's an incredible feeling. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without my amazing team. Uh, Harry West, uh, Luke Payne, Mal Parker, Bernardo Freitas, Jakob Aschenmeyer. Those guys absolutely crushed it. In the end, Chris Poole and his Riptide Racing Team hoist the Congressional Cup for a second time, proving why he and his team are still ranked number one in the world. A few weeks later and the World Match Racing Tour had moved to one of its most famous locations, Marstrand in Sweden. It was a breezy event for the 30th anniversary of the GKSS Match Cup Sweden, where the natural amphitheatre that has made Marstrand so popular delivered a superb spectacle. Taking the winner's check in the men's class, it was Chris Poole and his team on Riptide Racing that left victorious. And in the women's fleet, it was Sweden's Anna Ostling, the team wins, that took a closely fought win. Meanwhile, back in the UK, there have been a couple of things that have caught our eye. One was just down the road from the Planet Sail office, where Sir Thomas Lipton's Shamrock 5 was being relaunched after an extensive refit. She may have been the smallest of the Jays and the only one to be built in wood, but she's a gorgeous boat. 
Sadly, she disappeared off the circuit a few years ago after a collision. But now she's back. And the chat is, she may well be in Barcelona this summer for the J-Class regatta. I certainly hope so. Another piece of news is from Spirit Yachts, who've just announced details of a Q-Class. Often referred to as the Mini J-Class, this was adopted by the New York Yacht Club in 1903 to determine entry criteria for the America's Cup. Designed by Dijkstra Naval Architects, Spirit Yachts have been commissioned to build a modern version of the Q-Class, which is expected to be launched in 2026. A punchy weather forecast for this year's Round the Island race led the organisers to take the difficult decision to cancel racing for the smaller yachts and multi-hulls. And while conditions were benign for the early morning start from cows, by the time the fleet arrived at the Needles, it was clear that the ebb tide pressing up against a strong westerly breeze was creating a big sea state. By St Catherine's Point, at the southern end of the island, conditions were tough for even the big boats in the fleet. First to finish was Irvin Laidlaw's multi-hull Highland Fling 18, completing the course in 3 hours and 39 minutes. First monohull to finish was Peter Morton and his crew, on the TP52 Notorious, who also won the coveted Gold Roman Bowl for the overall win on handicap. This was the second time Morton had won the trophy. The sort of a classic round the island, there's either plenty of wind or no wind, isn't there? And uh, it was one of those days where there's plenty of wind. It's, it's just one of, the, one of the great classic yacht races in the world that uh, you, you try and win. So, uh, and it's 40 years ago since I won it with a little 25 foot boat. So it's, uh, it was special for me today to be exactly 40 years since I won it in a little boat called Odd Job. For all those that had completed the course, it was a memorable race. But the numbers said it all when it came to seeing just how tough this year had been. From an entry list of around a thousand, there were just 154 finishers. Once again, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe to us, it's free and it makes a big difference as to what we can do on the channel. Hit the notification bell to stay up to date with new content. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and of course our website. And if you'd like to advertise, we'd love to hear from you. We've got plenty going on this season and our viewing figures are right up there and continuing to grow. So we know we can get you in front of the right audience. In the meantime, thanks once again from Times Square in New York. Stay safe, stay well, till next time. Oh, 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 oh,